Recently, we talked about the breakdown of the Carolingian Empire after Louis the Pious. Well, let's talk about what became of the eastern part of that empire, East Francia, and how that evolved into the Holy Roman Empire, which I believe is best summed up as medieval Europe's Frankenstein monster. Let's dig in. Whenever you have a really great political leader like an Alexander the Great or a Charlemagne, all of his political heirs will really want to take up the mantle of his empire and emulate his achievements. Well, the problem for Charlemagne's heirs, the Carolingian dynasty, is that very few of them had the power to actually do what Charlemagne did because they did not control the entire family inheritance. Once again, Germanic inheritance laws. Now, um, a lot of these rulers really wanted to be active in Italy, but most of them were not able to because they didn't have territories there or because they had more pressing concerns in Germany. Um, the only emperor who really was able to try to take up the title of Roman Emperor and be like Charlemagne was Louis II, who ruled from 855 to 875. And his primary focus was on Italy and winning that imperial title, and he worked pretty hard for the money. He went down and he managed to expel the Arabs from Bari in 871. They had established themselves in the 840s, so that was a pretty major deal. But then the local Lombards who were hosting him decided that his presence was a threat to their authority, so the Duke of Benevento captured him and forced him to swear an oath to never return. A few years later, Capua was under attack from the Arabs. Capua is not very far south of Rome, so obviously Louis II left northern Italy to intervene. He managed to succeed, but then he died shortly thereafter. And after Louis II, no one else was either willing or able to emulate his deeds and try to really um, resurrect the title of Roman Emperor and follow in the footsteps of Charlemagne in that way. Going into the 830s, all of Sicily was under the control of the Byzantines as it had been for 300 years, so at first the Aglobid invasion was just a Byzantine concern. However, then they began to cross over into Italy and they also began to raid even places like Rome, so the popes became concerned. In the 840s, raiders actually laid siege to Rome and they managed to sack the basilicas of Peter and Paul, which were outside of the walls of Rome. Um, a later pope would then extend the walls of Rome to incorporate one of those basilicas, so it wouldn't be sacked again. The siege did fail, by the way, in case you were wondering. And they, one of the popes also built up a fortress near Ostia to try to prevent a similar raid up the uh, Tiber River from occurring in the future. At this time, the popes are desperate to gain the support of anyone who was willing and able to help. The Byzantines are getting beaten pretty hard in Italy, um, and their major concerns are elsewhere, so they're not of much help, so they were appealing to the Carolingians. And of course the Carolingians have their own issues that we've already looked at. And during this time, the papacy managed to forge a document called the Donation of Constantine. And what this is, is a document which states that Constantine left the popes um, with the power to crown the Roman Emperor. And if the pope has that power, then that means that any Carolingian emperor who happens to visit Rome and do some good deed for the pope could have an imperial crown with Roman um, prestige attached to it um, put on his head. So this is an inducement for Carolingian aid, and that is ultimately what got Louis II to come on down and help out and it is something which remained on offer for over a century before someone else would come along and try to take it up. So for reasons that we've already talked about, the Carolingians are unable to really do much to help the popes, so the popes have to turn to their old friends, the Byzantines. Now, the um, long-term effects of the iconoclastic era mean that Byzantine and papal relations are shaky, but things are returned to a friendly status when um, Pope Hadrian makes peace with the emperor and agrees to recognize Constantinople's formal power as being higher than that of Antioch and Alexandria. 
If you've seen my video on the second iconoclast era, you know why that's important in Constantinople, since the uh, the See of Antioch tried to coronate Thomas the Slav, who was a failed usurper fighting Michael II in the 820s, or 830s, whichever the case might be. I'm going to say 820s. Sounds right. I just made that video like 20 minutes ago. I don't know why I can't remember. Let's go with 820s. Final answer. Might be wrong. Anyway, so back in Byzantium, um, things are continuing to improve, and the Byzantines now have enough resources that they can try to get back involved in Italy, which for them is very much their tertiary theater. Um, Basil I, who ruled from 867 to 886, actually tried to coordinate a campaign with Louis II. They were contemporaries, and they were exchanging correspondence. But then um, when Louis kept started to use the title of Roman Emperor, the Byzantines got upset. And also they were going to do a marriage alliance between their two families, but then the bequeathed Byzantine prince happened to die, and that basically ended the possibility. Um, now the Byzantines do send an expedition in force in 879, but unfortunately for them, Syracuse, the last Byzantine city in Sicily, had fallen the year before. However, this expedition was still mostly successful since they were able to then set up three new themes in South Italy and really save that situation. Um, so that was good for them. They set up themes in Calabria, Lucania, and Lagombardi. So that will help them to remain. And this is how they were able to survive all the way up to the 11th century. Up to this point, it's just been you know decay followed by decay followed by decay. And now, finally, they've regained some ground, so if you're wondering, well, how did they stay in decline in Italy for so long, uh, they had at least one small period where they were getting things done. So let's go back to the Frankish homelands. Now, as you know, West and East Francia were still around, West Francia basically being France, East Francia more or less being Germany. And uh, they were ruled by various Carolingian contenders, but uh, over time, that family fizzled out. And in 911, the eastern branch of the Carolingian dynasty died out, which would have then given that realm to Charles the Simple in West Francia. The Simple means straightforward. It doesn't mean he's an idiot, by the way. Anyway, Charles the Simple, though, was being besieged by Vikings at Paris, so that really wasn't a great option. So um, the local nobles decided that it was time to elect one of their own and start a new dynasty. Um, this was further compounded by the fact that they didn't have time to wait since they had their own problems. There was a group called the Magyars, which would soon become known as the Hungarians, who were raiding Germany. And this was the primary concern for East Francia at a time when West Francia was much more concerned with the Vikings. So they end up electing the Duke of Franconia. There were five or so major duchies at the time. One of them was Franconia, and they, their Duke Conrad was elected as Conrad I. And um, he now became the leader of East Francia. However, when he died, the um, position of king or emperor then went to the Duke of Saxony, Henry the Fowler, who then ruled from 918 to 936. So this really establishes the precedent, which will later take hold in the Holy Roman Empire, of having electors, the most powerful men in the realm, the most powerful feudal lords, electing the emperor rather than it being passed on from father to son like your average everyday monarchy. At the same time, arguably the most interesting chapter in papal history is unfolding. This is the period that some historians have labeled the pornocracy. What happened is that the secular ruler of Rome named Alberic II, basically the guy who owned the Duchy of Rome, decided to force the Roman clergy and nobles to swear um, to him on his deathbed that they would elect his illegitimate son Octavian as Pope. Octavian, by the way, was all of 18 years old. Uh, although there were many young popes during this period, most of them were at least 25 or so, so he's still younger than your average pope. And in 955, Octavian became Pope John the Twelfth. Uh, so, the problem is, John was also the secular lord of Rome and Spoleto. And when his family's duchy was captured by the Lombards in, uh, I think it was 959 or so, 
he decided to ask Otto I, king of East Francia, for aid. And Otto I succeeded to the throne in the same way that Henry the Fowler and Conrad I had by election from the nobles. And John holds out this title that Otto had actually sought from a previous pope, the title of emperor, and he thinks that this will be a sufficient inducement to get Otto down with an army and enable him to reclaim his birthright, the Duchy of Spoleto. So let's go back to South Italy. By this point, the Arabs settled on Sicily have broken away from the Oglebids of North Africa, and they have formed themselves into the Emirate of Sicily, and they are now posing a greater threat than ever to Italy, launching all kinds of raids and invasions of Byzantine, Lombard, and other territories. At the same time, the Lombards went from almost being absorbed into one of the Byzantine themes to now having their power revived. In the 920s and 940s, the Lombards are actually on the offensive against all their neighbors, and they're reclaiming some land. Um, the Arab threat from Sicily is continuing to grow at the same time, though. So basically what we have is more or less a stalemate where the main victim seems to be the Byzantines who were losing a bit of land here to the Lombards and a bit of land there to the Emirate of Sicily. Um, however, the Frankish imperial presence will revive also under a new emperor who will, by his very presence, then revive the old rivalry between the Byzantines and the Franks. And that gentleman is known as Otto I, or Otto the Great, the first of the Holy Roman Emperors. So to recap, Pope John XII was the secular lord of Spoleto, and his duchy had been conquered by the Lombards in 959 or 960, and then he had called the king of East Francia, Otto I, to help. So Otto I arrives, defeats the Lombards, restores the land to Pope John, and then John crowns Otto I as an emperor in 962 on Christmas, just as Charlemagne was crowned emperor in 800 on Christmas Day. However, um, this will create some tension, and it looks like John immediately regretted the decision that he had made. So while the official holdings of the Pope would be extended beyond what any of, the pre when it, any of John's predecessors had held, um, he had to recognize the emperor as an overlord. Before this, the papacy was still technically a duchy under the Byzantine Empire, and now it will become a sort of vassal to the Holy Roman Empire. So this will be awkward since the popes claim to be God's representatives on earth and to have the authority to crown emperors. Um, one of Otto's heirs, I don't remember if it's Otto II or Otto III, correctly pointed out that the donation of Constantine was a fabrication, um, but that is only after some provocation by the popes, and it turns out that whatever the scholarly reasons Otto II or III may have had for pointing this out, they were actually completely justified as the donation of Constantine was, um, if you look at it through textual analysis, a very thinly veiled fabrication. Anyway, um, back to this. So, as soon as he had put the crown on Otto's head, John XII began to regret it and began scheming against Otto with local nobles. Otto found out and deposed him, and this is all going on within probably a month of this coronation. This moved very quickly. Um, so, John's coup, though, does show um, and predict correctly a long-term endemic Italian resentment against German imperial rule. Um, and popes who were appointed and uh, supported by um, Holy Roman Emperors generally only survived when the emperor was nearby and able to provide physical military support. Now, John XII, you know, having gone into exile in about early 963, was still trying to stir up trouble and regain control of his realm. When uh, he was, he died in bed of a stroke. Uh, while he was uh, with a married woman, supposedly, according to a hostile source. I like the story, though. We'll go with it. He died of a stroke in the bed of a married woman. Despite the fact this guy would have still been only in his mid-20s, he apparently had a stroke. Okay, whatever. Who cares? All right. So uh, Otto I then will go on to try to arrange a marriage between his son and a Byzantine emperor's niece 
the Byzantine emperor was unwilling to give up his daughter, since that would be really acknowledging the full legitimacy of this barbarian king. But a niece is a way which is satisfactory to, you know, is a prize satisfactory enough to Otto, while also not being insulting to the Byzantine emperor, who still sees himself as being superior to this barbarian of the West. And this marriage between Otto II and a Byzantine empress or princess will then lead to um, the birth of Otto III, who will rule from 983 to 1002 and be another important figure in Holy Roman Imperial history, even though he actually was not an adult for most of that period. So Otto took up the crown as Holy Roman Emperor in 962, but what is this new thing that he rules over? Well, it's basically the same as East Francia, but now it will become even more bizarre and complex. So it will retain its nature as an elective monarchy, which is unusual, and it will eventually grow to include seven electors rather than the five who put in Otto and his immediate predecessors like Henry the Fowler at all. Um, so, what is so weird and complex about this empire? Well, it never succeeds in centralizing authority, and if anything, over time, authority becomes more and more diffuse. And a lot of this dates back to Germanic inheritance laws, the same thing which brought down the Carolingian Empire. So, as each lord dies and leaves more than one son, we have more and more principalities and little areas cropping up. And because there is no real imperial government comparable to what we see it develop in France or develop in England or in the Byzantine Empire, each local prince will print his own money, have his own passports, and eventually also fortify his own territory and have his own little tiny army. So it becomes a sort of the empire becomes a sort of blanket political organization which contains lots of semi-independent little things within it. Um, you call them states, maybe micro-states would be a better description. And by the time that the empire is dissolved in 1806, it will actually contain hundreds of you know, semi-independent mini-states under the umbrella of the empire. And keep in mind, that's at a time when the territorial expanse of the Holy Roman Empire will have been greatly reduced by the large chunks of it breaking away to become actual countries. So, um, yeah, just a mess. Let's not go any further lest we confuse ourselves for no reason. Um, Otto and his successors are successful during the period when they had actual power at setting up their own bishoprics, and this gives the Germans a say in papal and Catholic affairs and some of their members will go on to you know, be elected pope in due time. Um, and each of these emperors will remain lord of his native realm. Again, this is part of feudalism, kind of. So if you're the Duke of Saxony and you get elected emperor, then you're both the Duke of Saxony and the Holy Roman Emperor. And you'll probably rule from the territory that you were elected from, since there is no real imperial capital. Um, you know, there's... I mean, I guess Aachen technically, but... Uh, you know, it's sort of for rent because when you die, your your son might not succeed you as emperor, maybe just as Duke of Saxony. So, kind of complicated. Um, and Otto III had an idea of what to do. He seems to have been trying to blend Byzantine and Germanic practices and laws, which would have meant trying to set up a more formalized state institution uh, of administration but he died without issue at the age of 21 in 1002 and when he died it looks like uh, most of the really good ideas which would have made the Holy Roman Empire something special died with him um, and one of the things that they did do to make up for their lack of formal power is to develop a highly elaborate court ritual which would distract you from the fact that they can't actually control any of their own nobles so let's look at what the Holy Roman Empire actually accomplishes. And one of the main things that it accomplishes is extending European civilization and Christianity further to the east. Um, 
as the empire pushes eastward against the Hungarians and Moravians, Moravians of course being a Slavic uh, kingdom, they promote Catholicism and also really spur on state development. Now Poland is formed on the frontier of the Holy Roman Empire in response to pressure from the empire itself, and in 966 Mieszko I, the first recorded Polish king, uh, converted to Catholicism and became a vassal of the Holy Roman Empire. That would have been in the time of Otto I. Later on, Otto III will oversee the conversion of the Magyar ruler Wyke um, to Catholicism, and then he took up the name Stephen, and his realm became known as Hungary. That happened in the year 1001. Um, interestingly enough, both Poland and Hungary constitutionally do reflect the Holy Roman Empire because both of them are loosely organized and the power of nobles is greater vis-a-vis -vis the king than in the Western monarchies of France and England, for instance. Um, the Holy Roman Empire will also later be the sponsors of the Teutonic Knights. Um, this organization was mostly responsible for um, crusading in the Baltics and trying to spread Christianity by force in that region and they're you know instrumental in the formation of countries like Estonia and Latvia um, so that is another long-term legacy of the Holy Roman Empire. The most famous statement about the Holy Roman Empire came from the French philosopher Voltaire who was active in the early to mid 18th century as a philosopher in France. When he looked at it uh, at the Holy Roman Empire, he saw this archaic medieval German monstrosity which made no sense and served no real purpose. And when he described it, he quipped that it was neither holy nor Roman nor an empire. So let's explore his claim and see how valid it was. Now by his day, it pretty much was spot on, but let's look at it in the Middle Ages instead, in the period when this empire was at its height. So the Holy Roman Empire and the papacy were not necessarily always on the same side, but they generally were, so that means that usually the emperor would be in good standing with the pope. And since the empire was instrumental in spreading Christianity north and east, you know, they were generally doing stuff that the Pope would have approved of. So, you know, you, they could actually make a claim to be a holy empire. They also participated in some of the major crusades, which we'll get into next week. So, you know, actually the holy claim, if you're looking at, say, the 12th century, or any random century of Holy Roman history when it's actually relevant, that claim actually kind of works. How about Rome? Well, it never really formally included Rome as a territory under the emperor, but it did incorporate Rome and it was founded due to the actions of Otto I in Rome. Um, so in a way it could claim a Roman heritage, although this is probably the weakest of its claims. Um, it was governed nothing like Rome. Rome was not an elective monarchy. Um, Rome then allow itself to really get subdivided or fall into a becoming a stereotype or poster child of why feudalism is not a you know legitimate or good form of government. I guess perfectly legitimate, but not good. Let's put it that way. I would edit that out normally, but I'm deep into this. So I'm just gonna keep going. Um, as far as it being an empire, though, now this is where it gets a little more complicated. An empire is simply any state which is formed originally by military force. In that sense, the Holy Roman Empire was formed by the conquest of Charlemagne and his successors, so it is undeniably an empire. However, it's a very strange empire. Most empires are centrally managed and they have a strong ruler, but the Holy Roman Empire was one which often lacked strong leadership. Now there were some strong emperors like Otto I and Frederick Barbarossa, but most of the emperors were not really that much more strong than uh, one of the other electors. So it really was an empire without a real emperor in many ways. So it's, it's not so much that it's not an empire as that it's an anomalous, strange empire. Um, it's kind of like a life form which would fall between being some sort of mold or spore and then being a plant. It's like one of those things that's kind of hard to really 
put in a neat box, I guess. Um, and because of this lack of central organization and the inability of the emperor to enforce his will through a bureaucracy or something like that, this means that the ability of this empire, which on paper is by far the strongest state of the Middle Ages in Europe, uh, this state still is not really able to project force beyond its borders. That's why the Holy Roman Emperors didn't try to reclaim their claim on France, for instance, by virtue of both having been ruled by Charlemagne, uh, because they just couldn't muster a big enough army to complete a conquest on that scale. It's also why they didn't try to, say, attack the Byzantines or something of that nature. They just didn't have enough resources because they didn't have the governmental apparatus to muster those kind of resources. We're not done with the Holy Roman Empire by any stretch. It will still be with us when this course ends in 1500, but um, I'll go ahead and give you a preview of what ends up happening. So this is already a confused mess of feudal obligations and small principalities held together by a largely nominal emperor who has trouble enforcing his authority. Well, this situation gets worse and worse over time, and after the Thirty Years' War ends in 1648, by the Treaty of Westphalia, things get even more confused when um, these states and their status in the empire is redefined in a way which actually does not do anything to resolve the issue. And this empire will be greatly weakened over time by the loss of more coherent areas like Austria, which emerges as its own power, or Brandenburg, which later emerges and becomes Prussia and also the centralization of France by the Bourbons and their predecessors to make France into a strong nation state which can then threaten Holy Roman Empire's interest along the Rhine and you know really prevents uh, the emperors from trying to launch any kind of offense to the West. Um, later on in 1806 Napoleon is the Emperor of France and he overruns the Holy Roman Empire as part of a campaign against Bavaria and uh, the Prussians. And he looks at it and he says, man, this is a stupid empire. This is a historical anachronism. And he looked at it and he saw hundreds of different states existing within the empire. So he breaks it up into more manageable realms, many of which he places under his own subordinates or family members. And then he recruits very heavily from these areas. And these become the majority of the men who actually die in his famous uh, invasion of Russia in 1812 and 13. So there you go, fun future preview of something we'll never get to. Let's now look at some of the positive contributions of the Holy Roman Empire to later history. Um, some of its chief components will live on and have a big impact on history. Um, Bavaria didn't quite make it to the modern age, but it was a very important player in Central European politics for a while. And, uh, you know, while it was never a major power, it wasn't anything to sneeze at either. Um, Austria obviously will become a big deal because the Habsburgs will um, eventually take over this area and it will kind of break away from the Holy Roman Empire. Um, Austria is still a country, obviously, and it was also a major player in early modern and modern European history. Brandenburg will evolve into Prussia. And then Prussia will be the country which the Kaiser and his Chancellor Otto von Bismarck, uh, that it will be their base for then unifying all of Germany into a nation state in 1871. So that is also an important legacy long term. Um, obviously, the Habsburg family was originally a noble family in the Holy Roman Empire. They managed to elect themselves to the office of Holy Roman Emperor for over two centuries consecutively without a break. And they didn't implement a constitutional change. They just kept winning the elections by having enough people and enough places. Um, and I guess that's a positive impact, I don't know, I guess it depends on how you feel about the Habsburgs. I guess really more of a neutral impact, let's go with that. Um, and one of the other legacies of having this really bad Germanic inheritance law and this ridiculous political system is that to protect your new holdings, every little lord needed a castle. 
And that is why Germany is the most castellated area on the planet. Because all of these local lords built their own castles. Um, so now when you go to Germany, you have lots of cool castles to look at. So that is one of the, I guess, positive legacies in a long-term sense. Even if in the short and medium run, this heavily did lead to the localization of Germany and really impeded its development. So, you know, legacy's kind of mixed, but it is still interesting. And without the Holy Roman Empire being the strange Frankenstein monster that it was, history would have gone much differently both in the Middle Ages and in the modern era as well.